Guten Tag and uh, welcome to my seventh Germany vlog um, in the uh, overall topic of Germany 1871 to 1990 and the second topic, um, sorry, the second uh, vlog in the second topic of um, the collapse of Germany at the end of the First World War and the establishment of the Weimar Republic. In the last episode, uh, we talked about how in 1914, Germany as a whole was united uh, in entering the war, but how over time disillusionment set in um, at the um, apparent stalemate um, and also at the um, increasing uh, difficulties of, of Germany managing itself and in particular how the economy began to fall apart and food supply um, seriously weakened uh, Germany's resolve. Um, now that uh, continues to be the case through to the end of the war but this time we're going to look at the kind of political end of, of that, uh, that dispute and that fracturing. Um, and to start off with, um, it's important to think about the war aims. Now, we said last time that the, the published official war aims um, put out by the Chancellor Theobald Bethmann Holweg uh, were that uh, Germany was going to uh, war to protect and help its friend Austria-Hungary, who were being um, themselves had war declared on them by Russia. And of course, because Russia was in an alliance with France and Britain, that, that dragged in the, the Western powers too. However, that sort of noble um, war aim was only uh, sort of a public war aim. And behind the scenes, Germany for a long time had been looking to expand uh, and gain itself territory and kudos through uh, military operations. And so there is a kind of secret war aim that the upper echelons of the army and the Kaiser hold. And that is that they must have peace, but they must have victory. And um, this uh, develops uh, fleshed out into what's called the Kreuznach programme, which is an ambitious and extensive um, shopping list, really, of, uh, of areas that uh, Germany would uh, like to um, take over, annex at the end of the First World War. So that includes uh, some uh, territory in the Baltics, some territory in Poland. It includes French coal fields, parts of Belgium. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's extensive on both sides, east and west. That seems to take a little small step closer in 1917, when after the Bolshevik communist revolution uh, in October, or November, depending on which calendar you use, 1917, the Bolsheviks pull Russia out of the First World War. Now, it, it takes some time to negotiate a settlement, um, partly because the Germans are extremely punitive in that, uh, in that uh, treaty negotiation. But uh, on the 3rd of March 1918, the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk um, was signed and Germany um, e officially then ended its fighting engagements uh, in the east, um, which super importantly freed up uh, many uh, men for them uh, and uh, um, uh, freed up a lot of equipment for them, which had been bogged down fighting the Russians. Um, and all equally, uh, it gained them lots of territory in, in the short term until um, the Treaty of Versailles took it all back. So in, in March uh, 1918, the Hindenburg and Ludendorff were still pretty optimistic about, uh, about their successes. But already um, back home in Berlin, the political situation was worsening. And that had worsened through 1917 with the bad news that in April 1917, the United States had entered the war largely uh, as a consequence of Hindenburg and Ludendorff's um, unrestricted submarine warfare, which had been um, itself provoked by the, the British naval blockade. So in June 1917, um, there had been a resolution passed in the Reichstag uh, saying that uh, peace without victory is uh, what we should be aiming for in Germany. And that by that, what they mean is that we should be negotiating an end to this war, kind of a, a score draw, as it were. And they link that to uh, future war credits, the future funding uh, of the German army. Now, because uh, Bethmann Holweg, the chancellor, had now lost control of the Reichstag, which was what he was doing usefully and was not in favour of the peace with victory Kreuznach programme, um, style of fighting, um, Hindenburg and Ludendorff decide that now is the time to get rid of him and they pressure the Kaiser. This is a great example of how they are the silent dictators. They pressure the Kaiser into removing Bethmann Holweg uh, from the chancellorship and replacing him instead um, with George Michaelis, um, who was um, really kind of a puppet of Hindenburg and Ludendorff. He was put in place specifically because he wasn't threatening to them. Nevertheless, the political pressure continues to be placed upon 
the uh, the leaders of Germany. And that is seen um, on the 19th of July 1917 with the Erzberger Resolution. Now, um, Matthias Erzberger was a centre party politician and he had spent, it's a great story, he spent ages uh, looking into whether uh, uh, whether Germany was capable of winning the war. So he went and talked to a number of people, including the um, uh, the Kaiser or the, the Emperor of Austria-Hungary. Um, he went to look at uh, uh, the army units. Um, he looked into supply um, of, of weapons and uh, um, ammunition. Yeah, he looked at everything that, that was there to it. And he came back to the Reichstag like a sort of uh, conquering hero of knowledge, a fount of knowledge. Um, and he said... We can't win this. Uh, we need to have peace right now. Erzberger's um, uh, credibility in the Reichstag and amongst politicians meant that his peace resolution passed by 212 votes to 26. This seems to be an enormous challenge to uh, the silent dictators, to Hindenburg and Ludendorff. But, of course, the um, they um, and even more so the Chancellor were not accountable in the slightest bit to the Reichstag. So other than um, some funding, pot potential funding problems, um, there was nothing really that the Reichstag could do to uh, limit the, the power uh, of Hindenburg, Ludendorff, the Kaiser or the Chancellor. And so the war kept going into 1918. And as I said, after the surrender of the, uh, the Russians and after the Treaty of brest there was some cause for optimism. And so on the 21st of March 1918, the last big German offensive of the war started. This was called Operation Michael, um, and uh, it was actually in many ways a spectacular success that the German army punched a hole through the Allied lines um, and uh, accelerated. They, um, at the peak of their um, uh, advance, they got up to 40 miles ahead of where they had started um, and were only 60 kilometres from Paris. Um, however, unfortunately, uh, they failed to capture Amiens and Arras. Uh, in fact, they end up capturing nothing of any strategic importance at all. A, a lot of the land that they did capture was uh, land that had already been fought over and so had been stripped of anything useful. Um, I was reading that uh, a lot of the wells in that land had been poisoned by the German army when they'd retreated earlier in the First World War. Uh, and so they, they actually end up uh, having advanced but having got nothing to show for it. Um, their advance runs out of steam because actually uh, the, well, the casualties they're taking are too serious for them to um, for them to keep going. And also because they uh, get too far out of um, out of reach of their supply lines. Um, it therefore grinds to a halt and eventually the Allies are able to counterattack. Um, in the offensive, the German army lost 250,000 troops. And between March and the end of April, they actually lose 350,000 troops. Critically, um, because the Allies lose a similar amount, the British and French, but critically, because the Americans have now entered the war, 30,000 American troops are now um, reaching Europe each month. And so where the, um, where the Allies, Britain, France and now America, were able to replace the troops that they lost uh, in, that, in that fighting in the spring of 1918, the German army just gets weaker and weaker. Not only had they lost a lot of troops, but they had lost a lot of uh, experienced um, and some of their best troops in, in that offensive. That really is the turning point of the war for the Germans. And uh, although it takes several more months for their defeat to be recognised um, and to be confirmed, actually it's from that point that it seems inevitable. On the 28th of September, um, Ludendorff went to see the Kaiser and told him that that actually he should start to um, work out how to get peace, that there was no hope left. And shortly after that, Hindenburg and Ludendorff um, resigned their positions, um, partly in order to be out of the way. That, that there's a, there is a thinking, um, a strategic thinking, that the Americans will be more open to negotiate if they've gone um, and if a civilian government is in place and recognised to be in place. There probably is also um, a private thinking of Hindenburg and Ludendorff that they can avoid some of the blame by being out of the way. Anyhow, on the 1st of October, Prince Max of uh, Prince Max von Baden, uh, I always want to call him Prince Max of Baden, which is what that means. Prince Max von Baden uh, is appointed as a new chancellor and his uh, government includes uh, some socialists in it and he immediately opens secret negotiations with America um, over uh, 
a uh, over peace. At the same time, he starts to institute some constitutional reforms. This is partly to impress the Americans, um, but it's also partly because the Reichstag has been um, angling and protesting and uh, campaigning for reforms uh, all uh, all along. Um, and so these reforms are passed and they include um, scrapping the Prussian three tier franchise, which is the Prussian um, the Prussian way of voting. So you remember, perhaps hopefully from 1871, that Bismarck, when he instituted elections to the Reichstag, every male um, over the age of 25 had a vote. So there's a straightforward franchise there. Franchise means voting um, qualification. Um, but uh, in Prussia itself, there was a three tier franchise, which basically weighted voting um, rights and uh, capabilities towards the wealthier. And that, that was scrapped. The Kaiser's military powers were reduced and crucially um, and probably most significantly, the Chancellor and the government were now made accountable to the Reichstag. So whereas before the Kaiser held the power, he appointed the, the Chancellor and the Chancellor just really uh, had to go to the Reichstag for money and, and not much else. Now the, the uh, Reichstag held the power and they could, although the Kaiser chose the uh, Chancellor, they, they could um, hold him to account over what was happening. So uh, these are significant reforms, uh, but they are political reforms and they're about the leadership of the country. They don't change the day to day experience uh, of Germans at this point, And they don't uh, crucially end the war. Um, also, I mean, if you were a German, you would look at the government and say, well, we've still got a Kaiser. That hasn't changed. The chancellor is uh, a Juncker and a prince. Um, there's no real reform there. And um, Disappointingly, I think the Reichstag doesn't really rise to the challenge of uh, being given these new powers. It actually didn't sit at all, in fact, except for one day between the 5th of October and the 9th of November. So it didn't sit at all between the 5th of October and the 22nd of October and then sat for one day and then uh, adjourned again uh, from the 22nd of October to the 9th of November. So like one day in over a month, which is hardly the actions of uh, a body that is looking to seize power. This then was what was known as the revolution from above, the constitutional changes that reduced the power of the Kaiser and instituted what would have been a much more democratic system. However, because of its limitations and because it doesn't change much, it's soon swept away by the revolution from below, which is what we'll look at next time. Thanks for watching. See you soon.